If you have uncontrolled blood sugar, meaning if you really eat a high carb, low fat diet, low to moderate protein, you're going to be hungry about every 90 minutes to two hours. It is very hard to fight that and try to do an intermittent fast. And I've, and I've done that. I, I, I cycle through so many things just as my own guinea pig. So those are the individuals that actually need to come down off of that high carb, low fat diet, adjust their macros before intermittent fasting. So I, I call it carbohydrate unloading, right? So carbohydrate yeah. unload for a few weeks, then let's implement intermittent fasting. So if you think about this, you almost have to have your nutrition game plan before base training. Hey listeners, Jeffrey Wu here, and welcome to this episode of the HVMN podcast. We've talked a lot about the concept of periodization, the intentional cycling of a pattern, but mainly through the lens of physical training. But how about applying periodization to nutrition? Can we further accelerate the metabolic adaptation and training through nutritional periodization? That's why I'm excited to welcome Bob Sibohar on the program. He's served as a dietitian for the US Olympic Committee, a physiologist for the US Olympic triathlon team, and coach a number of world-class athletes. He holds a number of degrees relating to sports science, dietetics, and physiology, and coined the term metabolic efficiency training. Even if you're not an athlete, this episode is super valuable and shares real life applications for anyone who wants to optimize their metabolism. In this episode, Bob and I discuss the application of intermittent fasting and training, the crossover point between anaerobic and aerobic exercise, and timing nutrition and shifting macronutrient ratios for maximum performance. Bob, thanks for coming on the program. I'm excited to have this conversation. Oh, I'm super pumped, super pumped, Jeff. Thank you. This is actually, it's quite an honor to be able to uh, chat with you. I've been following what you guys have been doing for quite some time and obviously, you know, talking to Brie about it. So thank you for having me here today. Appreciate it. And, and likewise, I think your research and your applications on how you're applying your studies to top performers is really interesting for our community and our listeners. So a lot of overlap here. Um, yeah. Perhaps just ground it for the audience. Uh, How did you get interested in sport? How did you get interested in physiology? Mm -hmm. I know you've worked with some of the best athletes with U.S. Olympic teams. I know that you've mm -hmm. been in industry working on developing some of the top products for performance. What's mm -hmm. your personal journey? I never knew what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I and I still don't know probably, right? Because there's there's always <laughs> dabbling everywhere. But you know, I just remember when I was in high school, and this is way back when, and you know, people, the, everyone gives you pressures. Oh, what are you doing with your life? What are you going for college? And I had no idea. All I knew was that I grew up as an athlete. I was a soccer player mostly, a little bit of basketball, and I just knew that like the human body just fascinated me. I was just I had so many questions that nobody could answer. Why does it do this? Why can I do this? Or why can't I do this? So I actually went to university not really knowing what I wanted to do. Um, I'm, I'm based in Colorado, did all my education here in Colorado. And I think I just chose schooling to, you know, pursue my passion of athletics and being an athlete. Once I got into school, you know, I started with, with exercise science. That was my undergrad and, and, and found it very fascinating, right? So that was my undergraduate studies was in exercise science, physiology. Then I went in the real life, you know, real world for three years. And what I found was... I was still having so many questions and nobody could answer them. And, and now I was actually applying my trade a little bit, right? But not, not necessarily a lot of nutrition. So I thought, oh, the only way I can get some answers is to go back to grad school. So I, I did end up going back to grad school. I got two master's degrees, one in ex-phys, one in food science and human nutrition. I knew in grad school that I wanted to be a sport dietitian. And this is, I'm not going to date myself too much, but this is a while back, right? And I, and I just remember my, my preceptors, my professors telling me, there's no way you're going to do that. And I said, what are, you talk, what are you talking about? Like, And this was, again, a while ago, and there were no jobs. Uh, there was no market for sport nutrition, really. I mean, this is, this is, you know, let's just say this was late 90s, early 2000s, and there was nothing. So I told them, you know, face to face, I said, listen, as soon as I get out of here, I'll just create my own. So I, I think the path that I took was really just trying to take the bull by the horns and making what my my passion was. But a lot of my career has been driven from trying to answer questions that I didn't have answers to, right? And, and I think that's kind of what where I've accumulated. I've been very blessed to, to work with fantastic athletes and teams and in recreational indiv individuals and fitness enthusiasts. So 
I, you know, when I left the U.S. Olympic Committee, and this was in 2008, people thought I was crazy, absolutely crazy, because, you know, it's the Olympic Committee, you know, everybody, you know, that's, that's the thing. And I said, you know, and my boss was very supportive, but I said, you know, I want to be able to touch many more people than just Olympians with the education, the knowledge, and, and maybe the fourth coming, you know, thinking forward thinking that I have. So that's kind of, you know, I've been on my own. This is my 11th year. And, and I feel that I'm able to actually, actually touch more individuals lives this way. I want to touch on the historical component, because that's something that I've thought about and had other guests talk about, which is yeah. sports nutrition is actually a very recent field. Oh, absolutely. I think if you look at the historical record, sports was very much a quote unquote gentleman's activity where it was sort of yep. people with means could have a side hobby to run track or play golf or play tennis. And only until the last, you know, you know, 20, 30 years, you actually have professional sports and college sports as a viable career path where it opens up the opportunity for much more people. Yeah, huge. And then from there, and it's kind of, I don't know if it's perverse or not perverse, but because there's a market for it that has really allowed people to create careers in the nutrition and in the physiology space to really support how to make better, you know, humans even better. So uh, I'm curious to hear from your perspective, that historical change, what were some tipping points that you saw that as you were as, you know, sort of pioneering part of this, this transition from no one is a sports mm -hmm. physiologist or a sports nutritionist to, yep. uh, you know, people can make big bucks advising the best yeah. athletes in the world to be even better. What were the, you know, highlights or inflection points for you? The first real reflection point was right when I finished my second master's degree, it was, it was what, 2000, 2001. And, and I was gung ho. I, I knew I wanted to work in sport nutrition. You know, I was just, just becoming, you know, getting my registered dietitian status. And, you know, I was, I was ready. You know, but and I was a non-traditional grad student. I was a little bit older. You know, I worked in the in the in the real life for a little while, so I, I wasn't you know that that wet behind the ears, inexperienced. But but I was ready to hit the pavement running, and and I actually did. Like I used a lot of my network and a lot of the professors I knew, and I said, listen, what where am I going? You know, do you have any like is there anything in our space that can utilize my talents right now? And unfortunately, you know, early 2000s, the answer I kept getting was no, no, no. I don't think, and, and I don't know the exact history of this, but I don't think it wasn't until the probably early to mid 2000s where we first even started seeing sport dietitians, sport nutritionists in the, the professional collegiate. I think it was more uh, a lot of behind the scenes. I think there were some physiologists, like in, in, in terms of like Tour de France teams. I think they were hiding, but I don't think there was anything really glaring. And that's that was that's when I had that aha moment. I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, did I did I pick the wrong trade? Not that not that that's such a thing, because I think if you follow your passion, your desires, but I started to rethink things and, and I think within about I mean, probably a matter of minutes, I knew that I needed to carve my path. Uh, and now, since then, as, as you brought up, there's there's hundreds of sport dietitians in D1 colleges, professional sports, the 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 military. I mean, it's I mean, it's yeah. almost ridiculous now. It's like I, I look at I, I mentor a lot of young dietitians coming through and I tell them, I said, this is a great time to be a sport dietitian. But it's a very difficult time, too, because now you're coming into the masses and you have nothing separating you from somebody else that graduated with your same degree, right? So it's yeah. it's it's not a tipping point yet, but but there is going to be a ceiling very soon to where I don't think it's going to stop. But I think a lot of people are, or a lot of companies, a lot of institutions are being very much more particular in who they hire. And what I'm seeing is the combination of physiology and nutrition. That is is kind of the, the money, if you will, right? It's not just coming out as a nutritionist or as a physiologist. You have to have both respective tr uh, fields to be marketable. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that the most elite organizations, both in both in pro sports and in the military that I've come across, I think think very much along the same lines. Where if you have human yeah. performance as an organization, you need the physiology, the physical aspect of training, yes. plus nutrition, all in one. And exactly. One of the talking points is that. In an organization, again, this is fairly bespoke to professional dietitians and physiologists. It's like they sometimes, oftentimes don't talk. It's like the nutritionist exactly. has their food plan, go eat this kind of stuff. And they don't talk mm -hmm. to the physiologists and know what kind of training that they're doing. And right. that's something interesting from your background where um, you've been thinking about nutritional periodization 
for quite some mm-hmm. time. And it sounds like you coined that concept, which is which is very mm-hmm. cool because I think in the mainstream for elite performers, I think the notion of cyclical training blocks is well understood. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're training for a marathon, don't just run marathons every single day for 12 right. weeks or run the Boston Marathon. Like do some shorter exactly. runs, do some longer runs. Uh, but I would say that the, new, the, the notion of applying that same periodization hasn't really mm-hmm. been well understood in the nutrition space. So right. curious to hear how did those ideas come together for you and yeah. give some of the historical perspective there. So I grew up a soccer player, uh, very competitive, a little bit of basketball in high school kind of a thing. When I got to college, at least the college that I chose, there weren't many opportunities for varsity soccer, right? So mm. I remember that is that was my turning point as an athlete because that's when I actually got introduced to endurance sports. So mm. I started running 5Ks. I had a friend in, in undergrad who who dared me to do a triathlon, right? And this was this was when was this? This was ninety three, right? Nineteen ninety three, and I and, and I said, sure, I'll you know I'll do it. I'm a very competitive person. I had no idea what a triathlon was, right? But I said, sure, I'll do it. Like I'll figure it out. Um, so so that that was a great introduction for my mindset in terms of being an endurance athlete because you can be a high performer and and it doesn't mean executive, doesn't matter, high, Olympian, endurance, strength athlete, doesn't matter you always share the same concepts and the same the same uh, language right so i remember very vividly in the early 2000s i was i was working actually as a, at a sports medicine center as the sport dietitian seeing a ton of endurance athletes a lot of ironman athletes uh, the facility was actually in boulder colorado need i say more right so everybody was coming through the door and almost every single athlete was they were complaining about gi distress about weight loss weight gain power to weight ratio that whole thing and i'm like Huh. And you know what I think what what really allowed me to kind of step into that space was was my physiology experience, my my dietetics experience, my experience as an athlete, but I'm also a, a triathlon coach and I'm a strength and conditioning coach. So so I always have spoken in periodization because that's what you do as a coach, right? And a physiologist. Yeah. The dietitians, they're starting to catch up nowadays. But what I did was I created all I wanted to do with creating the whole concept nutrition periodization. I just wanted to get athletes and coaches and dietitians and physiologists just to talk the same language. That's it. Like that was my only goal. And then it just exploded from there, which is fantastic because then I actually started making it more of a working model and, and, you know, really educating athletes and coaches. I've done a lot more education on that with dietitians than any other group, though, to your point. So I think that's what brought it all together. And, And luckily, my experience was not just as a physiologist or just as a dietitian or strength coach or endurance coach. From an abstract level, it makes total sense. So curious to hear. It, a little bit more tactically, what does this mean if I'm listening to this podcast and I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. I, I should be periodizing my nutrition? Yeah. Um, yep. What does that mean? Does that mean, you know, does that mean I'm going to yeah. do more of a keto based diet or a low right. carb diet at certain times or certain training blocks? Does that yep. mean add more carbs in? Obviously, right. uh, obviously you're going to have to dial this in per athlete, per right. starting position, yeah, yeah. per goal. But, yeah. here, but I think it would be helpful to, to our audience here to just anchor this to some tactical examples here on Absolutely. what you see our, see, see our common use cases or common scenarios. Here's the interesting to, th- to keep in mind. So nutrition periodization is actually, it's a much more simple concept than physical periodization. So for the listeners who, who are there, physical periodization, if you're working with a coach or a group or, or even just you know online training program, as, as you've mentioned, every physical training periodization plan will increase and decrease volume and intensity, right? We call that in the coaching world, training load, right? So you're always going up and down in volume and intensity, trying to get ready for your events or key competitions, right? And, and this doesn't even, let me just, just as an aside, it doesn't have to be a, a, an Olympic athlete. Like every recreational athlete does this. And even the, the you know, I call them the, the couch to 5Kers, couch to 10Kers, they still go through it too. They just don't know they're going through it. So as, as your listeners are listening to this, please remember that this actually applies to everybody, right? So physical periodization aside, nutrition periodization is quite simple because the main goal is only to supply enough energy and the right energy to make your physical periodization successful, right? So that's kind of 30,000 foot view, um, you know, basically supporting your energy expenditure needs. The kind of, as we get down to 20 and 10 and 5,000 foot view is looking at the different training cycles 
to your point, right? Is, is someone in base training, if they're an endurance athlete, are they in pre-competition? You know, if they're a football, soccer player, are they in pre-season, in-season, off-season? So this is the beautiful thing about me bringing this all together. Every coach in every sport uses different terms to describe their what are called meso cycles, right? Those are usually a couple months at a time. Every coach uses, but it, it doesn't matter what you call it. What matters are your physical goals. So for your listeners, keep this in mind. What are your physical goals right now? Are you trying to improve endurance, strength, flexibility, technique maybe, maybe more tactics depending on the sport? So based on your physical goals for that specific cycle of your training, your nutrition has to come in the side door to support that, right? So here's a great example. It's January. People are, endurance athletes at least, are starting to train for 2019, right? Could be marathons, could be Ironmans, you name it. Most individuals are in base training. So they're doing a lot of what we call aerobic zone one, zone two work, right? They're actually incorporating more fat metabolism, if you will, into most of their workouts, not a lot of anaerobic. So this is a time where, unfortunately, a lot of these individuals, endurance athletes, fitness enthusiasts, their, their eyes become bigger than their stomach. They end up gaining weight because they, here's the mentality, right? I'm going out for a run, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is. I'm going to come home and I'm going to eat everything I want because I'm exercising now, right? So that's, I, I, I've actually coined a little term that I like that I want to introduce this. My, my way of really identifying this with individuals is using this term, eat to train, don't train to eat, right? So support your training sessions with food instead of justifying your training sessions with food. So instead of coming home from an hour run and just inhaling everything in the fridge or pantry, maybe think, wow, you know, that was an hour run. That was an easy run. I probably didn't burn as many calories. I want to actually improve my fat adaptation response. Maybe I'm not going to throw a whole bunch of calories in my body right now. Maybe, maybe I'm going to wait, dare I say, until I'm actually hungry. <laughs> Because <laughs> I don't think people actually know that sometimes, right? But but if you fast forward, maybe in three months, four months, they're adding intervals and repeats and, and intensity is going up. Maybe volume goes down a little bit. They're breaking down the muscle a little bit more. They're, they're needing different macronutrients. So that's a time where we say, all right, yes. And, and, and let me go back to this stage right now. This stage right now, if you're in base training, sorry to digress, you shouldn't, you don't need a lot of carbohydrates you actually need a, a, a kind of a, a low to moderate. You need a little bit more fat to balance out your energy balance. And then protein usually doesn't diverge as much unless you're a bodybuilder or a power lifter, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we know at that point, we don't need a lot of carbs. And that's a person's biggest mistake during this time of the year. As they get to the next one where more intensity, more, more real, more interval-based training is, that's when we see carbohydrates start to creep up a little bit. But, but listen to this really carefully. It's not what we used to recommend 20 years ago. It's not the whole 60, 65% of your diet of, as carbohydrates. It's simply not that. That is absolutely ridiculous, right? And I can say that just in general, right? Everyone's individual. We know this, but in general. So, so we know carbohydrates creep up a little bit. Fat goes down just a little bit to kind of balance that out. Protein is still kind of in the middle. So that's that's what I'm call, that's what I'm talking about. When I created nutrition periodization, there were no fancy diets. Like what we had, we were working with back then, we were working at the zone. Uh, paleo just came out, which I have a really funny story about on the side if we want to get there. And and so I wasn't yeah. I wasn't developing nutrition periodization as a periodizing diet plan. I was periodizing macronutrients. And that's yep. the way I still describe it 15, 20 years later is saying, it's not about coming in and out of keto or low carb, high fat or paleo or whatever. It's about recognizing the amount of carbohydrate, protein and fat that needs to cycle through based on your energy expenditure. Fair enough. I think yeah. that's yeah. what actually is nutrition. I think when people have exactly. Atkins or carbohydrates, it's a zero sum game. You have three totally. food groups. You have fat, protein, carbohydrate. Exactly. Exactly. And it's a zero sum. You have to have higher fat. You got to have someone else, somewhere else has got to give and vice versa. Right. So right. it is essentially just a shifting a macro game. And I think people can segment out certain ranges as a keto diet or a low carb diet or an Atkins diet or yep. a standard Western diet. But I, I yep. think if you actually look at the math and you actually look at the science, it's just, just shifting macros. Um, it is. Yeah. And, and I think that's, you know, in my experience with, you know, some of the folks that we work with, yeah. Um, that, that exactly reflects what you're talking about. You shift the mm -hmm. macros during different training blocks. And I think, curious to get your thoughts on this. Um, 
have you have you even tried fasting in some of the more oh, base yeah. training zones to even yeah. more, uh, I guess, aggressively target the fat update mm-hmm. adaptation uh, uh, training? Um, Absolutely. So curious to hear about your experience with applying fasting, not from a weight management or composition perspective but just from a performance perspective curious to hear your thoughts on that if we would have had this interview 15 years ago and you said fasting i would think you're crazy right because that's because that's what you they teach you in education fasting is bad fasting is because you're sick you know you can't eat anything um so obviously the research has really caught up with that fantastic research out there about intermittent fasting and even prolonged intermittent fasting i actually do support intermittent fasting when when individuals actually know how to do it and when to do it it is mm-hmm. phenomenal, especially like you were mentioning, at different times of the year based on someone's training or fitness cycles, it makes total sense. I mean, I've played it with myself anywhere from 16 to 24 hour fast. I actually just did a 24 hour fast two days ago. Um, nice. and, and more so because I woke up and I wasn't hungry. So I thought, I'm just going to eat when I'm hungry. And, and really, I didn't, you know, so I think this there is absolutely great application of intermittent fasting. What I worry about, because I've seen this, um, I do a lot of physiological biomarker testing with individuals, uh, and, and I've seen, unfortunately, females as they get older, if they are too aggressive with intermittent fasting and really prolonged, we're talking 20 to probably 32, 36 hours, it starts to disrupt their hormone balance. Um, mm-hmm. And I have seen it in smaller amounts in males with the testosterone, but I, I just think that's why I think with intermittent fasting, people should be supervised by a professional in the beginning and, and get blood marker testing because that can really mess things up. From a performance perspective, it makes total sense to do intermittent fasting during base training because you are actually helping your physiology, your mitochondria adapt to utilizing fat as a substrate, right? It, it makes total sense. Unfortunately, a lot of people, if they don't believe it, you know, they obviously have to you know, talk to one of us and we can supply the research, but a lot of people don't do it because they don't think they can. They think it's too hard. They don't know how to do it, but more importantly, I believe, and, and, and you know, we'll get into the whole metabolic efficiency here soon, but if you have uncontrolled blood sugar, meaning if you really eat a high-carb, low-fat diet, low to moderate protein, you're going to be hungry about every 90 minutes to two hours. It is very hard to fight that and try to do an intermittent fast. And I've, right. and I've done that. I, I, I cycle through so many things just as my own guinea pig. So those are the individuals that actually need to come down off of that high-carb, low-fat diet adjust their macros before intermittent fasting. So I I call it carbohydrate unloading, right? So carbohydrate unload for a few weeks, then let's implement intermittent fasting. So if you think about this, you almost have to have your nutrition game plan before base training, right? You don't just jump into base training and say, here it is, right? And help set the expectation here. And I think a lot of people are like, they try a fasted workout for the first time. They're like, holy yes. crap, this is terrible. <laughs> um, exactly. I've done this. I'm sure you have with your with yourself yeah. and with the athletes. I think we, yeah. how should we set the expectation here? It is supposed yeah. to be hard, just like it's supposed to be probably hard the first time you go back to the gym after the winter holidays. Can you describe that and, and walk through that? Can we help debug it a little bit for people that might have misconceptions about it? It's not like you do it, you start fasting, you have a workout and you're just awesome. From day one. It's funny because I think a lot of people, when they follow diets, they think immediate gratification, it's going to work right now, right? Unfortunately, the body has to adapt. You know, physiology takes a little bit longer than we think it does um, from a biological standpoint. So I think the expectation should be if you try anything new, and, and you alluded to this, if you try a new exercise program, right, you should give yourself at least seven to 14 days. That's that's kind of the, the marker I do to allow your body and your cognitive uh, center, you know, your brain, your, to adapt to those changes. So not even from a behavioral standpoint, from a biological cognitive standpoint. So I think it's very important, one to two weeks, the expectation is follow it. You may not feel good, um, you know, but here's the thing, because because I have actually just recently did this two weeks ago. Um, I did a lot of fasted workouts. I lower, you know, low carb, high fat. I, I've never gone pure keto. I just, for my body, it doesn't work to go that low carbohydrate. But, but you know, I would do morning fasted runs and just, you know, the same course, same distance, you know, I'd analyze it, my, my pace per mile slowed down, my heart rate was higher. So, but those are the expectations, right? So I think, I think mentally you go into it saying seven to 14 days, I expect these things to happen. 
And you know what? It's okay. Like allow yourself to tell yourself it's okay not to feel good before every workout. I mean, I coached and, and still coach some really high pre- performing endurance athletes and have to remind them that about probably 60% or more of your workouts are not going to be good. And that's okay, right? You're still building fitness. You're still doing what you want to do, but, but really embellish that 40% that really feel awesome. So after seven to 14 days, your body will adapt, right? As long as you've stuck to the consistency and the frequency, your body will adapt. And that's, the, that's when things start coming around a little bit. So, you know, instead of using the whole New Year's resolution mindset, use the more long-term I'm in it uh, mindset to actually change something about myself. I think a lot of our listeners aren't, I mean, they're just, there's not that many professional athletes in the world, first of exactly. all. But I think exactly. more and more yeah. people want to train at that level because of, of challenging themselves. And I think, what would your practical tips be for someone like me? I'm never gonna be a professional athlete, but I want yeah. to maximize the time I put into my fitness. Um, right. I know, it, it, does that mean, it, am I gonna still get value of cyclical training block? Am I still gonna get value mm-hmm. from a nutritional periodization approach? Mm-hmm. Uh, curious to yeah. hear your thoughts about that. Or is it okay if I just go to the gym run, you know, on the treadmill and do the same, you know, lifts every, every single day. So we know the neuromuscular connection with the, the, the muscles and the mind, very, very important, right? So if, if a person just says, listen, you know, I just want to stay fit, want to get healthy, want to maybe lose some weight, body comp, whatever it is, just remember this. So in the first four to six weeks of engaging in any new exercise program, your body adapts from a neuromuscular standpoint, right? So you may not see a lot of hypertrophy or, or, or you know, the muscles enlarging gains, but you'll, you'll see strength gains. And that's usually enough to keep those people motivated, which is fantastic. Unfortunately, if you don't continue with some type of cyclical training, and it doesn't have to be complex at all, you will bottom out, you know, the infamous plateau, and you'll wonder what happened, right? I'm not doing this right. So I believe every single person has to have a plan, maybe not from day one, right? But but maybe it, the plan starts to form. And it doesn't have to be a complex, you know, structured periodization plan that, that you know, a physiologist or a high endurance, co- high performance coach puts together. It just has to be changing about every three to six weeks. And that's kind of the key, right? But you think about it, as we talked about, as that changes, if your nutrition doesn't change, and, and mind you, I work with a ton of recreational individuals. I mean, that's like, like to your point, there are very few professional athletes and there's a whole bunch of us, right? Yeah. And I have to remind them, I say, listen, as your training changes, if you keep eating the same thing every single day, and you and I know a lot of people are creatures of habit and they will eat the same thing every day they will and their and their exercise patterns change maybe they're lifting more maybe they're running more whatever changes their body will adapt but unfortunately it will only respond as much as nutrition is going to support that right so i've actually seen a lot of people lose muscle mass uh, bone density decreases because they're not feeding themselves enough right because they're not aligning the nutrition with the fitness changes yeah. and that i think is is huge i think everybody needs a plan consistency you know, allow yourself to be human, but we need to have a consistent plan. Yeah, and I think the malnutrition, undernutrition, I think it's an important part of the conversation because I think mm-hmm. a lot of us think about overconsumption, but let's not Absolutely. swing too hard on the other side. You know, don't fast right. for three days, seven days, and and, and yeah. do marathons. It's, it, that's not going to be a great outcome either. Uh, so exactly. let's find the let the smart path in between the different uh, extremes here. Uh, I want to move on to metabolic efficiency. And I think that's a yes. interesting term because I think in different fields, different researchers have right. different interpretations of what does it Absolutely. mean for metabolic advantage, metabolic efficiency. Um, yep. I want to hear your, uh, you know, how, how you came up and, 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 and thought about metabolic efficiency and, and yeah. how you define it and how you think about it. It was right just right after the time that I, I started to put together nutrition periodization concept, right? And and it was starting to come together because, again, as an athlete myself, and, and back then, 
I was engaging in Ironman, uh, you know, uh, training and Ironman events and like longer distance stuff. So I was actually living this life at the same time I was teaching these athletes. So I, I got to experience it firsthand, which was awesome. I mean, it was, I mean, talk about firsthand, uh, you know, knowledge to be able to do that. What I was noticing is that a lot of these, these individuals, and I'm talking recreational athletes, I'm not talking about our Olympians were coming to me for two reasons, either GI distress, right. Or, and, or, body composition reasons. And I, and I was like, God, oh, that's fascinating. And that's, that's where nutrition periodization came. But then I started to explore a little bit. I put my physiologist hat on a little bit and I said, Hmm, you know, if the body has like tens of thousands of calories stored as fat and, and only up to, you know, probably 2000, if you're a larger male stored as, as, as carbohydrate wh- one, why is that? Okay. That's an easy question to answer. Cause physiologically we know, but two, is there, and this is what I asked myself in the early 2000s, I asked, is there an opportunity to teach our body to, to mobilize all these fat stores that we always complain about, right? Oh, my middle, my hips, you know, whatever it is. And so I actually went back to all my physiology research, my theses, everything. I'm like, God, did I miss something? Like, did I, was I sleeping through a class? And I remember coming across the infamous crossover concept. And, and if you're familiar with it, for, for your listeners, I'll explain it briefly. The crossover concept is basically this. It's the association of fat and carbohydrate burning over different intensities, right? So mm-hmm. as we're sitting here right now talking with each other, we should be burning more fat because we're in a rested state. But if we got up, we started doing some plyos, some stairs, some sprints. As the intensity increases, our body relies more on carbohydrate. Now, the crossover concept is is basically a crossover is at what point does the body cross from more fat burning to carbohydrate burning? So I was looking at that a lot years and years and years ago. And, and another way to put it is aerobic to anaerobic as well, right? Exactly. Aerobic to anaerobic. Absolutely. Yep. So oxygen consumption versus non-oxygen consumption. Bingo. And, and so oxygen consumption, aerobic, favors more fat metabolism. Anaerobic or you know uh, uh, without oxygen or the very little favors more carbohydrate metabolism. So there's a balance there. And, and I've you know to die to kind of transition really quickly. I've worked with a lot of strength and power athletes too, like at my time at the Olympics. So it's it's not the same concept. So for your listeners, if if you're hitting the gym three times a week and you're doing some lifting or some CrossFit and then you're also running or cycling or whatever. Those are actually very dynamically different in terms of nutritional needs because the energy systems that are being mobilized are extremely different, right? So we actually do have to look at that a little differently for as an aside, right? But so I was looking at the crossover concept, doing some research into it, and this is what I recognized. This was, I think the crossover concept was developed back in the 50s and 60s, right? The only thing that they looked at was the contribution of exercise to how our body burns fat and burns carbohydrate. Mm. So of course, as the sport sport nutrition guy, I'm thinking, well, why didn't they look at diet? Why didn't they look at nutrition, right? That is how metabolic efficiency really was born in my mind, was that nobody had looked at nutrition. So being a physiologist, I developed the test for it. I put you know myself and some other athletes through the test. I, I refined that. And voila, I was able to measure a person's ability to use fat and carbohydrate on a treadmill, on a bike, right? And the best thing about it, it's, it's so submaximal. It's not a hard test. It's, it really isn't. It's nothing near like a VO2 peak or VO2 max test. And how are you testing this? Are you doing this? through respiratory RER yes, ratios? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So so utilizing a metabolic cart, you're, you're basically looking at the RER ratio, oxygen consumed versus carbon dioxide produced, and you're looking at that 0.7 to 1.0 scale and through a series of intensities, right? So, so you hop on the tra- the treadmill with me. We'll probably start you walking. You know, every four minutes we go up in 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 uh, intensity, and I basically look at that point in time that your body starts that shift, right? Yep. I call it. Th- so, so the difference between the crossover point and and the crossover concept and metabolic efficiency is that crossover only deals with exercise, right? Exercise is ability to adapt our body to burn fat. The metabolic efficiency is really looking at the nutrition and the exercise components, right, yeah. together. So here's the interesting I want to thing. For, w- w- one second oh, yeah. here, just to give parameters yeah. for our listeners so they can follow along. So 0.7 is the RER ratio of a fat burner, where there's, uh, sev- I guess, you know, s- it, this is uh, oxygen to carbohydrate. So, uh, or sorry, or 
So for fat when you're super fat burning, you need more oxygen. So you have seven carbon yep. dioxides out, 10 uh, oxygens coming in. And then for 1.0, that's 100% yep. glucose burning. And you have a one to one ratio of carbon dioxide and oxygen. So this is to give exactly. the listeners some parameters of the spectrum here of what we're measuring and what we're talking about. And that cross or that metabolic efficiency point happens at 0.85. So that's 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 where we see it on the metabolic cart with the data that we receive. That's when we know you're exactly crossing over at that time. So it's not a guesstimate, right? Yeah. Um, and, and let me just say real quick, because a lot of people have come up to me and say, oh, do I need to have the testing done to actually you know, move on the stage of being more metabolically efficient, more fat adapted? You don't. It's just gonna eat. It's just gonna lengthen your learning curve a little bit, right? So I've worked with hundreds of individuals around the country and the world. They don't have access to testing, right? Not many people actually do the testing performance centers. So you you don't need it because here's the, here's an interesting thing. What I found from all my preliminary testing was that nutrition makes up about seventy five percent of this whole equation in becoming a better fat adapted individual. Exercise is important. Don't get me wrong, right? Aerobic exercise, as we know from physiology research, improves the mitochondrial capacity and enzymatic activity to burn fat. We know that, right? But right. you're going to be banging your head against the wall if you just do aerobic exercise and you don't change your eating patterns. So I actually, when I work with individuals, sometimes I don't even care about their exercise program. I just put all my eggs into helping them with their nutrition. Are you on a ketogenic diet? Interested in intermittent fasting? Well, listen up. We're launching three brand new products to make keto and fasting easier and better. HVMN MCT oil powder, Keto Collagen Plus, and Fasting Aid. Our MCT oil powder is made of pure C8 fat for fast and sustained keto energy. Our Keto Collagen Plus blends grass-fed collagen protein with MCT C8 to give you the best of the worlds of fat and protein. And our fasting aid doubles down on the metabolic benefits of fasting while helping suppress appetite. Currently, these are all on pre-sale at 10% off. The pre-sale discount ends on February 22nd, 2019. Visit www.hvmn.com slash pod to learn more. You can still order after that date, but without that 10% off discount. So act fast. Now back to the podcast. It's interesting from, you know, some of my experience with doing RQ studies and, and play yep. around with diet. If you are yep. eating super, super keto, super, super high in Absolutely. fat, it is interesting that you can actually see these these crossover points change. Or if you're just at rest, you're at 0.7. It's like, whoa, like you can actually manipulate uh, the the ratios here, which is cool from a biohacker or a quantified self-perspective. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. So you, you, th this is measurable. This is not, uh, you know, a... Uh, you know, Bob being theoretical, being like, hey, I could potentially theoretically change how your body is consuming oxygen versus carbon dioxide. No, this, you can actually get this measured quantitatively. But I think that your point yeah. is right. Obviously, if you have data, it closes a loop. If you don't have data, which is probably fine, it's harder for you to understand what's going on, but you could probably t tell from your heart rate and some other, other, other attributes. But I'll let you talk about, uh, yeah, maybe maybe that may be a good way to get back into the conversation here, which is um, if you don't have access to an RQ, you know, lab, um, what are other signs in terms of how you can kind of in, into it, how are you uh, you're adapting to a more aerobic fat burning state? Here's the beauty of this um, metabolic efficiency. Again, 75% is, is nutrition related. 25% is exercise related. But the concept itself is actually very grounded in scientific research in terms of blood sugar, right? So when we take a step back, and I feel I, I need to intro this before I answer your question, blood sugar control and optimization is the name of the game with metabolic efficiency training, right? So the way we do that is combining the, the, the right types and quantities of carb, protein, and fat. Once we actually can control our blood sugar well, your blood sugar uh, normally, in, in a, in a non-disease state, normally our blood sugar goes up and down about every three to four hours. Depending on what type of nutrition plan you're following, you can have that go up and down every 90 minutes to two hours, like if you're putting in a lot of sugar, a lot of carbs, uh, or you can extend it by going a little bit more low-carb, high-fat, right? So to answer your question, the most, and I know this sounds silly, but the most qualitative measure of, of actually improving your body's ability to, to adapt to fat or to burn fat is how long 
you're, you go in between feedings. And I don't call them meals. I just mm. call them feedings because a lot of people just snack throughout the day, right? So yeah. if you can actually extend your feedings from you know maybe two hours to three to four to four and a half hours to five hours, you know 100% it's working. So yep. you don't that's even a smart, need a lot of smart. quantifiable data. Yeah. yeah. So you don't need, I mean, you can look at heart rate, you can look at that stuff, but there's not a heart rate without testing. You don't know exactly where that is. So if we come back to qualitative, it's all about blood sugar control and optimization. Which is really funny because I think if you just look at p- common popular discourse, people are always saying, if I don't eat for two, three hours, I'm really <laughs> hangry. And exactly. Yeah. I, was, I was listening to uh, an interview on Stephen Colbert with uh, the, the new representative in, in Congress, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, yeah. and she was saying that if if I don't eat for two, three hours, I'm going to be really snarky on Twitter and, and, and clap yeah, back yeah. at people. I'm like, whoa, yeah. she's, uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's pretty metabolic, unflexible if you get yes. hangry in two, yes. three hours. Exactly. And it's, you know, I, I will say there's a problem. How common <laughs> is that really? I mean, I think you've been working with you know, recreational athletes, professional athletes. I mean, all yeah. these people are yeah. exercising so much that they do require much more calories and much more fueling. Mm-hmm. I'm curious to yeah. hear from your perspective, are these people overfeeding to a point of being pre-diabetic or being so mm-hmm. insulin uh, resistant because they're constantly feeding? Here's to hear uh, the performance aspect slip into from a potential medical perspective. And I think that's right. something that I don't think a lot of people talk about, which is it's a little bit orthogonal or or, 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 or disparate in terms of optimizing for max mm-hmm. performance versus maximizing right. for longevity. And oftentimes those are conflicting yes. goals, right? If you're trying to oh, be the best, strongest person ever, that might not expand your lifespan and vice versa. So curious exactly. to hear about your experience around um, First, the sort of the hangriness of potential of the, of the athletes and two, just the broader yeah. uh, thoughts around the orthogonal yeah. nature of performance and longevity. It's interesting because even as you mentioned, recovery nutrition, which is what we think of as post-workout competition or nutrition, that has changed tremendously in the last five years with research, right? So, so number one, the field is always changing. Always. I mean, it's kind of fun because it's kind of like a sporting event, right? The, the field, the scope of practice, it's always changing, right? Yeah. But, but here's the thing. Uh, I think individuals need to understand that sport nutrition is always a combination. It's an equation, right? Sport nutrition is equation or combination of daily nutrition. So that's their meals and their snacks plus nutrient timing, which is basically their nutrition periodization, their training nutrition, right? What they're doing before, during, and after. If, if they can actually conceptualize that, we look at daily nutrition from a health perspective, right? So I always, I always kid athletes could be the highest performer, could be recreational. If you're not healthy, you can't perform. Like you're not going to be able to train. You're not going to be able to get fit, whatever. So that daily nutrition is where we always begin. Like good sport dietitians always begin with daily nutrition. We optimize blood sugar. We look at biomarkers, blood work, and we make sure they're where they need to be. Then we move over to the training nutrition, the nutrient timing, right? So to your, to your point, I think there are some individuals who can really dodge the bullet in terms of insulin resistance, prediabetes because of great genetics. And oh yeah, they just, they exercise a ton, right? So they're kind of, they're kind of prolonging that. I mean, I remember a conversation I had with a really prominent iron, you know, professional male Ironman athlete. It was a few years ago and we were talking about nutrition and everything. And I asked him, you know, I asked him what he was doing. Cause he's, he's actually getting close to the end of his career. And I said, what are you doing now? versus what you were doing before. He said, I'm not changing anything. And I said, oh, so you're eating. And this is a guy who puts in just a ton of carbs, ton, just every, like every yeah. bar, you know, that you can think of that's high carbohydrate. And I said, you know, even though you think you might be quote unquote bulletproof right now, you are aging, you're getting, you know, close to your late thirties, early forties. You need to start changing something now because you could be you know, obviously risking some some health parameters as you're not changing your nutrition plan. Uh, my point is this. There are a lot of people out there who think they can get away with just having great genetics. It doesn't last forever is my point, right? So we need to look at, you know, the amount, really it comes down to the amount of carbohydrate you're putting in your body and what that's doing from a biological perspective uh, to your pancreas, to your blood sugar, uh, to your hormone levels, right? So from that aspect, I think people really need to take care of, of looking at their nutrition. And I work with a ton of endurance athletes. 
unfortunately, while the mantra is changing, the paradigm of cha- is changing a little bit, the paradigm still is I'm going to eat as much sugar as possible because I'm working out, right? And I'm trying to change that. And I've been trying to change that for about 15 years now. And it's and it's coming along. You know, but it's it's a very slow process. Um, I think I think individuals are seeing different products, different companies come out that actually support metabolic efficiency now, which is great. Um, yeah. You know, you've got ketones, you've got super starches of the world, you've got all these great non-sugar resources, and so they're starting to think about that a little differently, right? To my point of nutrient timing, do you really need a gel? before a 45 minute training session? Like, do you really need to plug like all this protein powder right after an hour bike ride? So my, my job is to help people try to realize what am I actually doing and what is my body needing in terms of nutrients? Like, do we need to, do we need to look at muscle protein synthesis? Do we need an aggressive glycogen repletion strategy or not? I don't think a lot of people realize that, that your body in a non-disease state, again, your body can replenish glycogen stores in 12 to 24 hours just with your own nutrition strategy, right? And, and so that goes to, th- to make us think, do I really need hundreds and hundreds of calories coming from sugar immediately post-exercise? Sometimes, perhaps, but I would argue most of the time, no. Like our body, yeah. <laughs> here's the thing too, our body is so amped to burn fat after workouts but we're throwing a whole bunch of sugar in it at the same time. So that's going to blunt the fat adaptation process, right? So I actually counsel quite a few athletes in terms of that post-workout window, that 30 to 60 minutes, and say, if we need sugar, let's do it very strategically. Let's not do a high amount so we don't blunt the fat adaptation process. And if you don't have an important training session in the next 24 hours, we're not going to refeed you a high bolus of sugar. We're actually going to introduce a little bit more protein, a little bit more fat, maybe some uh, some some uh, vegetables, right? Some more more carbohydrate that's not going to accelerate glycogen depletion, but it's just going to push it along at the at its own rate. I think one of the things I observe at a lot of these races is that. It's like candy time for adults because oh, exactly. you're, if you're just slamming gels, you're running like a 5K. It's yes. like you do not need yes. a gel or like, you know, five gels for a 5K. Um, yes. Yes. But I, I get it. It's kind of fun. You, you have like this excuse to consume anything. What you're yeah. saying is that, you know, of course, sugar is useful for certain applications, but it's not go overboard here. Uh, right. It's right, just right. being rational Absolutely. about how you best apply these tools. Um, right. And I want to touch upon uh, if you've had consideration on the longevity uh, dimension versus the performance dimension. Uh, mm. Curious to hear your thoughts about that. If you have any insight or experience as you're counseling some of these aging athletes, okay, yeah. how do I make sure that um, I, I manage both? And I think for a lot of people that are listening to our program here, uh, very few of the listeners are trying to be an Olympic gold medalist. And I think a lot of their right. goals is like, okay. Right. How do I maximize longevity while not necessarily being, you know, like on a caloric restrictive diet where I'm emaciated half the time? Right. I, I want to get the right. best of both. I want to be healthy, fit, have a great body composition, and be productive at right. work, and maximize longevity. Um, right. Any any thoughts around those kinds of goals? I'm living that in that space right now, obviously with the the aging athlete. Right. Um, yeah. I, I think. Looking at the different genders, right? We know males and females go through hormonal changes, mid thirties, late thirties, forties, depending on on their genetics too. We look at hormone changes significantly as we get older, right? And it's usually people always think about the forty year old mark. Um, that is really an opportunity, I think, to step back and look at two things: exercise and nutrition, right? So we know from an exercise, well, we we know from a physiological standpoint, biological standpoint, we're going to lose, uh, we're going to lose some oxygen capacity as we get older. We increase body fats, we lose muscle mass. We we know that happens. So I look at this as an opportunity in in the two prong approach. Let's look at the type of exercise you're doing, number one. Uh, Knowing that I work a lot with endurance athletes, as they age, I actually incorporate a little bit more strength and conditioning um, Mm. that that is very structured, but it it actually improves their body's bone density, improves their muscle mass, it slows sarcopenia a little bit. So from an exercise standpoint, huge opportunity. From a nutrition standpoint, 
even though a lot of studies done in 65 and 70 year olds um, have been done in terms of restricting calories as we as we get older, when you talk about someone who's a little bit more athletic and fit, and, and again, not your high performing athlete, just your average, you and I, we're going out, we're having fun, we're doing some strength, aerobic, whatever. I think we need to really look at macronutrient shifting a little more closely, right? And even from a timing perspective. So that's what I see with our aging athletes. We can have the best of both worlds. But the nutrient timing, especially of protein and different protein sources uh, and carbohydrate in terms of not dumping so much sugar in your bodies, that has to be timed a little bit more methodically around our running sessions, our lifting, our CrossFit sessions because of the aging biological process, the dampering effect that, that aging has on us. So I think when we're young, we get away with things, right? As we get into our 30s, things start changing. Once we hit our 40s, we have to be very smart into knowing what types of food we're putting in our body, but when we're doing that. Like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna lift or I'm gonna do a CrossFit class or anything, I better be ready in the first 30 minutes to maximize muscle protein synthesis from some type of food because I am fighting sarcopenia. But my 20-year-old self would would never care. So I, I do believe there is a best of both worlds. It just requires a little more thought as we get over that 40-year-old mark. Yeah. And it sounds like the interventions there are being smart at the type of exercise you're doing, potentially yep. having more of a strength program than to shifting macros. And it sounds like make sure Absolutely. that as you're aging, as you're potentially getting more insulin resistant, potentially reducing some of the carbohydrate intake, especially Absolutely. on the refined side and upping some of the fat, yep. which I think are good practical tips here. Uh, moving to, again, to the performance side, again, I, I want to get yeah. into the head of a, working with Olympians here. And I think a lot of us aspirationally yeah. wish we were at that level. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have any good anecdotes of, of really, really pushing up someone's metabolic efficiency? Again, that crossover point. Um, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I, I think just from a rule of thumb perspective, after a certain heart rate threshold, you know, right. 140, 150 people, a, a heart rate per minute, people start getting anaerobic mm -hmm. as a kind of general rule of thumb, perhaps like a zone, this is like zone three, four, five higher, right? Right. Um, yep. Have you seen cases where you've helped someone go super aerobic at, or, or maintain aerobic capacity at a very, very high heart rate mm -hmm. level? Curious to hear if they have any mm -hmm. interesting anecdotes or or, or training protocols to get someone to that kind of metabolic efficiency. If I can go back to quoting the whole crossover concept research back in the 50s and 60s, that that point where the body crosses between fat and carbohydrate burning, they the, the scientists identified that to happen in most individuals between 63 to 65% of max VO2 or max heart rate, right? Mm -hmm. That's why if you go into a health club, you're on a treadmill, stairmaster, you see those little charts that are the fat burning zone. That's the data they're using, which is very, very old. Um, the, the point is this. I've actually measured this metabolic efficiency point, that crossover, to be as high as 89% VO2 max of an individual. Oh, and that was, that, is... that was not an Olympian, right? So uh -huh. you can, you can kind of get yeah, this is just your average Joe Schmo, <laughs> but here's what happened, right? We actually, and here's a takeaway, I, I go a little bit layer down from this um, and I call it microcycle periodization. So basically, I look at this and, and I say, okay, Jeff, Monday through Sunday, what kind of workouts are you doing? Right? You're going to give me your duration. You're going to give me the intensity. You're going to give me what type of exercise. Is it lifting? Is it aerobic? Is it sprinting? Whatever. Once I know what those are, the duration, the whole thing, where they fit in your week, that's when I very methodically shift your nutrients. So I think I think people think, oh, wow, I need to follow a nutrition plan for 7 to 14, 21, 28 days, whatever. I actually vary it daily for those high performance is what you're talking mm -hmm. about to be able to maximize metabolic efficiency to its fullest. So mm -hmm. example, uh, you wake up in the morning and, and you say, well, you know what? And this is like a, a high performing, more like an Olympic endurance athlete. Um, I'll use a triathlete as an example because I've worked with them quite a bit. They wake up in the morning. They've got an early morning cycling session. Could be on the trainer, could be outside. I ask them what their goals. Usually sessions like that are aerobic based, right? It's oh dark 30. It's in the morning. If it's in the right training cycle, I will pull back their carbohydrate, pull back their fat protein. We will do it fasted. 
but I need to know what session is next when it comes next and what those intensity goals are and physiological goals are. And that's the whole nutrition periodization because I might turn around and I worked with, with actually a 2008 Olympian, um, not 2008, I'm sorry, 2016 Olympian two years ago. It's exactly what we did. He was a young male. We, I got, you know, I was on the phone with his coach. I, I looked at his training program and as the dietitian, I went in and I said, here's where we're eating carb, protein, fat at this ratio. And it could be six hours later, we're doing something completely different because we're trying to maximize performance gains. And that's the big thing, maximizing glycogen replenishment, hydration, and muscle protein synthesis. So that's, I, I, I can't, I don't know if you can tell, but I get so amped up with this because yeah. it's one thing to recommend a shift in macros. It's another thing to shift the macros every single day. And in fact, sometimes two to three times a day. And I will right. tell you, a lot of Olympic athletes are doing this. Yeah. And I, I think okay. that's probably behind the curtain that is not well understood by an everyday recreational athlete. It's, right. it's at, at that such a high level. The genetics and the physical training is is oh. is pretty much there. I mean, you got to be a genetic freak and you're probably yeah. exercising yeah. a lot. And then what yeah. are, and how do you get the unfair advantage? Or how do you get the advantage over your competition? Well, it is like exactly. dialing and nutrition to that kind of level. Um, totally is. Uh, I'm curious to hear your thought right. because I think you basically raised the interesting point, which is metabolic efficiency in of itself of getting 89% aerobic of your VO2 max mm -hmm. isn't an end-all be-all mm -hmm. metric, right? It sounds yeah. like that's, yeah. some, that's a, an, a recreational athlete. Um, mm -hmm. Then maybe there is no, great answer to this but what physical biomarkers or attributes do you see common in the top tier is there something like that or is that just a combination uh, of attributes top tier meaning the higher higher fat burning at higher vo2 yeah these are people that want to win olympic gold medals what are the biomarker yep, yep. characteristics that you like to see yep. from from your experience here's the first non-biomarker characteristic but it's a psychological char characteristic of of being consistent being persistent and following the plan, right? I, I always, I always say one of my taglines is trust the process, right? So these individuals, when they have a nutrition plan in front of them and an exercise plan in front of them, nothing gets in their way. Like literally, nothing gets in their way. If if they're going to eat X amount of carbs or this food, they are eating it at that time, right? So that's the first psych psychological mindset shift. Um, in in terms of biomarkers, I don't, I don't want to say I require it or it's mandatory. But when you make dietary shifts that extreme, if you don't keep up on your blood lipids, on your testosterone levels, different hormone levels, you will be in your, doing yourself a complete disservice because I've seen so many people kind of hop on the keto thing and they're like, oh, I'm feeling great. I'm, I'm down 50 pounds. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they go in for their annual physical with their doc and things are off the charts and not in a good way, right? So those individuals, they get biomarker testing, no kidding, probably every four to six weeks to make sure the dietary manipulations, more so than exercise, are actually encouraging good health instead of hampering good health. And, and that's, I mean, shout out to everyone doing keto and low carb, high fat. I mean, it's, it's tough. We know it's tough. One, you should probably cycle that, right? Two, please get biomarker testing. Like you absolutely need it more than your annual physical. To, to make sure things are dialed in. I mean, I think that's probably useful generally for everyone, not even for people yes, on a specific diet. Yes. I think it's more just like, exactly. from from how I look at it, just like you're driving your car and you open your eyes every minute or so. I mean, that's yeah, like yeah. a snapshot <laughs> yeah. amount of data you're getting if you do an annual right. blood panel. Whereas, Absolutely. Uh, I mean, hopefully in the future, we have continuous streams of all these biomarker datas and, right. and you can actually right. dynamically shift. Um, yes. I, I'd love to get one layer, you know, deeper in that onion. I mean, yeah. blood lipids. I mean, what are specific biomarkers that you think are interesting? Um, is that looking at like facet blood insulin, facet blood glucose, mm -hmm. yep. uh, C-reactive so protein? I mean, if you just give nice. a smattering yeah. of the key uh, yep. markers, that would be interesting to, to, to hear. So the first one I'll, I'll say is don't worry about cholesterol and, and all that. Like you really, like, since we're going a little bit deeper into this, when someone comes at me and they say, Oh, my cholesterol is 200. I say, great. You know, what are you, what's your, what's your small dense particle size? What's your like, so, so we need to look at, at more of the, the in-depth 
blood lipids, right? So when you get cholesterol done, please have what's called an NMR panel, which is basically looking at particle size of small, dense LDL, that, that quote unquote bad cholesterol, uh, versus the large fluffy, you know, and it, it looks at kind of the partitions of LDL versus HDL. That's number one. Absolutely need that. Do not just get the basic cholesterol blood lipid screening. Um, aside from that, I think CRP is very helpful. I don't see that changing too much in terms, or unless someone really exacerbates changes in their exercise program. Um, but, but it's still a great biomarker to add. Definitely, definitely fasting blood sugar, uh, blood glucose and blood insulin. Those are absolutely necessary. Um, I go, I go pretty in depth with vitamin D quite a bit too. Mm. And iron status, you know, working with individuals, especially females, um, iron status changes quite, quite significantly. Those are, those are probably the major ones. I like looking at magnesium. You know, I, I can get into, you know, things like magnesium for sure. And we look at red blood cells and white blood cells. Those are a little less common for the most part. I think kind of the smattering of CRP, vitamin D, iron, and then the in-depth blood lipid, the NMR profile, I think those are probably your, your money biomarkers. What are the typical characteristics of a top performing athlete? And, I, and I'm sort of uh, thinking also in my head in terms of a lot of folks in the military after they come back from mm. a lot of deployments, they also have an interesting characteristic, but usually not right. on the good end, good end where uh, right. if, if folks have seen a lot of combat, their cortisol tends to be elevated for Absolutely. certain periods of time. Their testosterone yep. is lower. Um, right. I would say that the professional athlete has a different type of stress. They're probably not having bullets fly across them. But, right. They, right. but, but I think there's a comparable level of maybe of stress and physical exertion yeah. if you're doing – you're probably not doing marathons every weekend, but there's probably, right. you know, in, in, in some sports, maybe that level of exertion. Um, oh, yeah. Are there characteristics or, or, or signs of overtraining that you tend to see when yeah. you see athletes or, or folks go too far or, or too overstressed on their training? In the coaching world, when I put on my coaching hat, I use the term under recovery a little bit more because I, mm. I look at recovery a little bit more a little bit more dynamic, a little more naturopathic, if you will, because there's, there's, I mean, so much to do with recovery. I think, I think a lot of high performers think, oh, I take a, a day off and I'm recovering all of a sudden. Right. And it's, it's much more about that sleep nutrition, but, but I think what's important to realize and, and tell me if I'm not on topic is when we're looking at under recovery or overtraining signs and symptoms, we're looking at, at, at very high fatigue, obviously, psychological differences, cognitive differences, physical differences. From a biomarker standpoint, though, I think, I think cortisol, like you said, is, is very important. Um, what I think a lot of individuals don't realize is that diet is linked to cortisol. Right. And a lot of times if people are trying to push themselves and they're they're filling up what I call their stress bucket, right? That there's training, there's lack of sleep, there's whatever, right? Their stress bucket keeps on filling. They've got to allow that stress to come out. Diet can be an added stress. And, and you know, a great example, if someone goes on keto and they're trying to have a high volume, even maybe high intensity training uh, status they're going to see some very interesting changes very quickly, right? And that's where, and that's where we know, obviously, there's a carbohydrate to cortisol link. So that's, you know, that the beauty of nutrition periodization is recognizing when the nutrients are needed and when they're not needed. Um, that's why I'm not too big of a fan of, of diets that just partition you into one way or, or, or no way, basically. But I, I think looking at those specific biomarkers, cortisol uh, is a very useful one. Um, specifically, I've actually turned a lot of keto people into what I would say more low carb, high fat. So they've got a little more wiggle room because biomarkers, cortisol, um, actually blood lipids have been completely in the negative part of the stress bucket for so long. Yeah, no, I think that's well said and I think reflects some of my personal N equals one experiments where I've yeah. tried to go essentially like carnivore keto, just from a yeah, self-experimentation yeah. perspective. And I'm trying to increase my training load and it just is tough, right? Oh. If you're trying to run and you're doing, you know, very, very like minimal carbs, it's tough. Yep. I mean, and I think maybe the counter argument to that is, okay, wait six months to keto adapt to get fully right. adapted. And I think there's some, uh, I would say controversy. Can you really, really get to enough of an efficiency mm -hmm. where you can compete with someone that is right. feeling with carbs? Um, yeah. Maybe curious to get your thoughts on that. I mean, yeah. if you look at nutrition Twitter, there's maybe, I think there's like the sort of, I would say vegan world. And then there's the keto mm -hmm. 
cult, <laughs> which is pretty polar. Um, curious yeah. your thoughts on on the the polarization of social media yeah. on nutrition as one question, but then two more on the physiology side. Um, the most of the data that I've seen is that while you can keto adapt on a ketogenic diet to a very very efficient state, the best mm-hmm. in the world are still using carbs for mm-hmm. for their races unless you're like doing 100 milers unless you're doing very right. very very long endurance races yeah um yeah and i think that that's a nuance that i want to and i hope we can talk a little bit about is that even for the advocates on the keto side which some people would say that i'm more on a low carb keto advocate side th- we should be nuanced right. that you, you're not gonna you know eat no all fat and go into a, a baseball game or a or a football game, and then perform your best right. without having right. getting some carbs in. Um, so, curious, get that that part of the question and, and get your thoughts on that. But you know, first, I, I guess it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on the polarization of social media on nutrition. Obviously, your yeah your experience there, you you have a lot of credibility speaking about it. But you probably see the polarization. You're yeah. like, whoa, this is kind of a crazy religious dogma war. I'll tell you straight up, that's what keeps me in business, to be honest with you. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to poo-poo it, but but I, you know, there, there's some frustration. I, this is the way I, re- I refer to it. If I get frustrated looking at this po- polarization on the internet and in and, and social media, I can't imagine what, what individuals without any formal education on this topic do, right? So it's, it's so so incredibly frustrating for so many people because they don't they don't know what to do. I mean, I've had a lot of people to me who were, who were on keto and they just want to make sure they're doing it correctly under my guidance. I've had some people completely, uh, you know, vegans come to me and they actually <laughs> actually go back to, you know, eating some meats, right? Because what we try to find is, yes, there's that polarization, but somewhere in the middle is optimal health and performance. I do not believe, and this is just N of one, personal, professional, I do not believe optimal health and performance lies on one of the polarization ends. I do believe it's somewhere towards the middle. It doesn't have to be non-vegan. It doesn't have to be non I I just seem, it just, there's some wiggle room in there somewhere. Um, Mm. I've seen some very unhealthy vegans, extremely unhealthy from from blood work (laughs) standpoint. So that polarization is one. I, I think, you know, you brought up this ultra runner as an example. I work with a lot of ultra runners and ultra cyclists here in Colorado. You can fat adapt, I mean, so incredibly well. You could keto, you could low carb, high fat. But here's the thing you can, and I've done 100 mile races, like you can supply a lot of your energy from fat and you don't have to really eat a lot of carbs during the race, right? But you take that 100 miler, 100 mile runner, and you put them into a fast 5K, 10K half marathon. They'll run well because maybe genetically they're inclined to, but they will never, quote me on this, never achieve optimal performance that right. they could have done with adding strategic carbohydrates, right? So so there's that polarization too, right? We yep. look at the, the distances that people do, yeah. Yeah, I think that's like the nuance, I think, in, in, in the social media world. You just can't have that explanation around, yes, like caveat, caveat, caveat on how to strategically exactly. apply low carb or high fat or using right. carbs strategically. Right. And yeah, curious to hear about, you know, the big plans that you have in store in 2019. Tell me about Baroda Foods and and all the things that you're seeing and want to apply and get the world word out there to to the world. I'm excited because there's so many different opportunities to periodize someone's nutrition, number one, right? Different sports, people are taking on these huge adventures, you know, these bucket list items. So from from one of my, my primary business is energy performance, right? That's where I provide the nutrition coaching, physiological testing. Um, but, you know, a couple of years ago, <laughs> this is so funny, you, you ask about Baroda Foods. I was out on a bike ride. It was about this time of the year. I live in Colorado. You know, when it snows, it melts pretty quickly because we've just got intense sunshine. But it was just one of those days. I was freezing my butt off. I was on my road bike, and I was probably about an hour away from home. And I started fantasizing about what could get me warmer, right? And I'm doing all the tricks I could do. But but the only thing that came to mind was hot cocoa, right? I don't know why. You know, I grew up with hot cocoa. It's warming. <laughs> It's and funny. so I just hightailed it to my to my house, right? And I started just creating, but but I wanted hot cocoa, not how I was, not how I grew up, right? A lot of sugar, marshmallows. I didn't want to dump in a lot of pro-inflammatory, just bad stuff into my body. So this story kind of begins on my bike with thinking, how do I warm myself up that doesn't involve a lot of sugar, right? And that was a hard question to answer, but I had a lot of time on my bike to think about it. 
what I have going on, so Barota Foods uh, started with a, a, a fellow sport dietitian who's also a chef and a food scientist last year. And we're trying to kind of similar to what I do in my career as a, as a nutrition coach, sport dietitian, I refer to myself as always that salmon swimming upstream, right? I am always going to question the why. I'm always going to ask why. So we're kind of going at 2019 trying to question the cocoa and the creamer market. So we make three products. Mm. We make a smart cocoa. Uh, unsweetened smart cocoa. Um, and the unsweetened is basically just no stevia, right? We have no sugar in our products. And then a creamer product, smart coconut creamer. We're trying to challenge these markets and saying, why do we need sugar in a beverage or in a powder to actually utilize in, in, in these functional ingredients to improve health? So we're kind of going against the big guys right now and saying, you know, we, we put functional ingredients in all of our products. They increase ketone levels. They improve, obviously, metabolic efficiency or, or else, you know, I wouldn't be doing this. Um, improves cognitive thinking. You know, everything that you think, I mean, improving ketone levels would do, that's what our products are doing. So I am so excited. I never thought, as a dietitian and as a physiologist, as a coach, I never thought in a million years I would actually come out with a product Right. I thought people were crazy when they did that. Right. Because I'm, I'm a health professional. Right. But I think with the knowledge I have in my in my partner in crime and knowing what we want to do with these functional ingredients in terms of improving the body's fat adaptation response, but more importantly, health, like getting rid of this pro-inflammatory sugar in, in common beverages and in, in common applications. That's my main focus for 2019 is just trying, just trying to provide a whole bunch of education, obviously through Barota Foods, through our products, but, but writing articles, doing blogs, doing podcasts, just challenging the norm. And that's what I've done my entire career. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm sure in parts of the world, less so in San Francisco, but having a warm, yeah. hot cocoa sounds oh, nice yeah. in the winter. Oh, and it's like, yeah. you don't necessarily want a sugar bomb at 10 exactly. p.m. sitting at the fireplace exactly. where you're just gonna right. you know spike your blood sugar as you go to bed so that sounds like a yeah you know something yeah. to consider and how many millions of people drink coffee i don't even know the stat right but but here's the thing like my wife drinks coffee and, and i watched her for years i'm like what are you putting in your coffee right she's putting milk um she's putting maybe some you know that artificial cream where i'm like and i'm like mm -hmm. oh my god how how i don't want to say bad because there's great you know benefits of coffee and the polyphenols but you're sabotaging your morning cup of, of goodness with all this, dare I say, just crap, right? And that's yeah. that's another thing we're going against is that norm and saying, why don't we actually get a powdered creamer that is working for your body instead of against it? So it's it it's it's a hard process. It's, it's a huge mountain to climb. But, you know, I'm in Colorado and I'm an ultra athlete anyway, so I love climbing mountains. <laughs> I think it's going to take folks like yourself and the community listening and folks that are understanding the nuances of shifting that macro ratio, it's, right? And I think, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure the, the way you're seeing it with um, the, sort of the inbound traffic in terms of the interest in this area, I think it's continuing to grow. So hopefully, you know, oh, yeah. the rising tide lifts all ships and really just makes a world better for everyone where people in all of sight just a little bit healthier, a little bit happier, a little bit more productive. So. Exactly. Uh, excited to exactly. track and support the journey here. So, where do people find you, and where do people, yeah. uh, you know, Twitter website? Where do people yeah. learn more about your work? So, I am all over social media. Uh, you can Google my name, Bob C. Bahar. Obviously, it's a little hard to spell uh, on the last name, but I'm all over. Been around for quite some time. Like I said, you could find me on one of my websites is Energy Performance E N R G Performance dot com. That's my nutrition coaching business, and then Barota Foods is B I R O T A Foods. Foods.com. That's more of the smart cocoa, smart creamers um, that that are really more of the product based. But I've got so many educational articles uh, out there that are just floating. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram. So I'm pretty easy to locate uh, once you once you know my name. That's all you need. <laughs> Thanks so much for that interesting conversation. This was really fun. Appreciate the time. Oh, it's been fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time here. And, and hopefully your listeners gained a little bit from this. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for tuning in this week. Every month, we release a new HVMN product offer available on our website. Simply visit www.hvmn.com slash pod to view this month's special offer. Of course, writing reviews and sharing the show with your friends are appreciated as well. Until next time, Jeff out.